Good morning and welcome to our St. Luke's online service. It's good to have you with us as we uh, bring ourselves before God in worship and uh, to learn from him, from his holy word. And today, of course, we continue. Uh, this is the second last of our series in Elisha and Elijah, those two prophets of God. And today uh, I'll be speaking about um, the Lord's care for his greatest enemies. Uh, so we'll have that in a minute, but uh, it's good for us to be together. We're going to begin and prepare our hearts uh, to uh, come into God's presence by praying the prayer of the week together. Let's pray. Almighty God, whose Son, Jesus Christ, is the resurrection and the life of all who put their trust in him, raise us, we pray, from the sin of death to the life of righteousness, that we may ever seek the things which are above, where he reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Uh, we want to confess before God uh, today and every day that we fall short of his holiness and that we don't live up to the life uh, that he has, has brought us into. And of course, that, that perfect life that we uh, long for at the resurrection of the dead, that final day when the Lord Jesus returns. But in the meantime, we want to acknowledge our sins uh, and uh, lean on God's mercy. Uh, it says in Joel chapter 2, Return to the Lord your God, who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And so with that reassurance, we confess our sins to Almighty God. Merciful God, our Maker and our Judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us, strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, of course, the great news of the gospel is that God desires that none should perish, but that all should turn to Christ and live. We have confessed our sins. God pardons those who humbly repent and truly believe the gospel. What great news that is. Well, we're going to have our Bible reading for this morning from Second Kings. And if you've got your Bible there, it'd be great to follow it along in the NIV, 2 Kings chapter 5. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending you my servant Naaman, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God? Can I king, kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, 
and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farfa, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Please accept now a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry. For your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other God but the Lord. And may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Rimon to bow down, and he is leaning on my arm, and I bow down there also, when I bow down in the temple of Rimon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. Go in peace, Elisha said. After Naaman had traveled some distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, My master was too easy on Naaman, this Aramean, by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running towards him, he got down from the chariot to meet him. Is everything all right? he asked. Everything is all right, Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say, Two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. By all means, take two talents, said Naaman. He urged Gehazi to accept them, and then tied up the two talents of silver in two bags with two sets of clothing. He gave them to two of his servants, and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. When Gehazi came to the hill, he took the things from the servants and put them away in the house. He sent the men away, and they left. Then he went in and stood before his master Elisha. Where have you been, Gehazi? Elisha asked. Your servant didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. But Elisha said to him, was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or to accept cloves, olive groves, vineyards, flocks, herds, or men servants and maid servants? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence and he was leprous as white as snow. And this is God's word. Well, let me begin this morning by asking, when something is free, do you take it? If you're offered something and there's no charge, are you suspicious of that offer? Or do you accept it? Well, it really depends on what the offer is and who's making it, doesn't it? We all have people in our lives that we make reciprocal gifts to on an ongoing basis. For example, friends and relatives. Sometimes we give them a gift or sometimes they bring us a gift and there's no suspicion there because we understand their motives. We're friends. We're family. And we usually don't think that much about it. We're just thankful for the gift. And the same goes for food samples at the supermarket or down at the train station, if the deli is giving out uh, free olives or chicken marinade, it's not that big of a decision. Let's assume this is post-COVID, uh, of course. 
Uh, well, naturally, you're going to take the chicken sample because there's little obligation to buy it straight away uh, and they're usually pretty delicious. Now, on the other hand, if you, for example, got an email from a stranger offering you a million dollars, well, you're more likely to be suspicious of that offer. We're more likely to willingly receive from someone if we know them or we trust them or we can clearly see their motives. Now, we're at the tail end of our series, as I mentioned before, of Elijah and Elisha, those two prophets of God who served uncompromising ministries of teaching and preaching and discipleship, often in the face of overwhelming opposition. Uh, last time we were with Elijah in chapter 4 a couple of weeks ago, and Liz took us through the chapter and we watched as Elijah stood in for his predecessor, and performed miracle after miracle, establishing himself as a worthy successor of Elijah and as a genuine prophet of Yahweh. Uh, to take a couple of examples, he miraculously supplied cooking oil for the poor widow. Uh, another time, he raised to life the only son of the woman of Shunem. He also cleansed the stew that was otherwise poisonous. And finally, he multiplies the supply of bread, enough to feed a hundred people. And now, with his credentials firmly established, his reputation has spread far and wide, even across the border of Israel into Syria, even into the upper ranks of a foreign army. But let's make no mistake about it, Naaman the Syrian was no ally of Israel. In fact, as the commander of the army of Aram, he had been leading raiding parties into Israelite territories, no doubt spreading fear and panic amongst the population by sacking villages, burning fields, and kidnapping children to use as slave labor. So while he was feared and hated in Israel, he was a man of great status and accomplishment in Aram. He was a favorite of the king. He could do no wrong. But there's a sting in the tail. Verse 1. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. So while he seems to have everything going for him, status, wealth, esteem, the loyalty of his troops, even the favor of Yahweh, it says that the Lord had given victory to Aram through the armies Naaman commanded, but despite all this, he had leprosy, a disease which attacks and eats away at the nervous system, his lungs and his skin, leaving him vulnerable to injury and infection and potentially paralysis. Now, because he was still active in army service and, and he still personally attended the king, we might infer that the leprosy was still in its early stages, and so he was still relatively able-bodied. But Naaman and everyone else in his household knows that this disease will eventually lead to disability and finally to death. But help comes from the most unlikely of places. One of the slave girls who attends his wife, that slave girl is an Israelite. Well, she's one of the victims of Naaman's raiding parties. The same forces that the Lord himself had given victory to. And now why had God chosen to give victory to the kingdom of Aram when those victories were causing such death and distress to his own people? Remember that the people of Israel, they're his, his precious, his beloved people, his treasure. Why is he putting them through all this? Well, it's the same reason he brought famine and drought on the land in the time of King Ahab. The kings of Israel served and they continue to serve foreign gods. And the kings lead the people away from worship of Yahweh. They remember, God relented from bringing disaster to Ahab back in 1 Kings 21 after the incident of Naboth's vineyard. Why was that? Why did God relent? Because Ahab 
truly repented of what he had done. And so God promised to delay his judgment and only bring disaster during his son's reign. And now that Jehoram, son of Ahab, is, is now on the throne, still like his father in many ways, perpetuating injustice and idol worship, well, now God is bringing the consequences he promised. But judgment for the Israelites will mean salvation for Naaman. And this is the, one of the astounding things about the sovereignty of God, about, about his control, his, his power worldwide, that he can cause one set of events, even devastating events for his chosen, chosen people, that these events can lead to the fulfilling of his purposes. And so the poor Israelite girl, torn from her family and from her life in Israel, likely never to return, she is the key to bringing healing to her captor, her kidnapper. 2 Kings 5 verse 3, She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. See, she remembers that there is a prophet in Israel, one who still serves the Lord, one on whom the favour and the Spirit of God still rests, one who is even more powerful than his predecessor, one who has the ability to heal and purify and feed the hungry and raise the dead. If anyone can help Naaman, it's Elisha the prophet. So amazingly, Naaman takes her up on this. Uh, amazing, because why would he believe the word of a slave girl? What if this is some kind of trick? What possible reason could she have for recommending a cure for her captor? Well, maybe he figures that he's got nothing to lose. Maybe he's tried all the doctors and magicians and priests in Aram, and it's all come to nothing, and now he's desperate for a cure, even the remotest, remotest possibility of a cure of relief would be worth it, and he figures it's worth the risk. So that's one option, or maybe God has already begun to work in Naaman. Perhaps even now, God is bringing him to a place of humility and an openness to God that will finally result in his complete healing. But whatever the reason, Naaman goes to his boss, the king, and applies for leave, and the king's happy to give it, and so Naaman's on his way. Uh, his first stop when he gets to Israel is at the king's palace. Naaman fronts up to the king of Israel with his chariots and his personal guard and his pack horses bristling with bags of gold and silver and expensive clothing. A big gesture for a big miracle. And the king of Israel, we can assume this is still King Jehoram on the throne. Well, he freaks out. He tears his clothes. He has a fit. This powerful neighbor has shown up on his doorstep, loaded with gifts, expecting something great. And now the king's worried he'll leave disappointed. The king doesn't know what to do. You know, this powerful neighbor is going to leave mad. And who knows what kind of reprisals this could lead to. The king just doesn't need this kind of pressure. Now, Elisha hears about the king's tantrum, and Elisha isn't the biggest fan of the king. He's made that clear earlier, back in chapter 3. That Elisha helped the king in his campaign against Moab, but just like he did back then, he's willing to get the king out of a tight spot. So he says to the king, don't panic, send Naaman down to me. And so Naaman next goes to Elisha, and nothing's going the way that Naaman pictured it would. Firstly, Elisha doesn't answer the door. He sends someone else to greet Naaman and give him instructions. Verse 10. Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. And Naaman gets offended by this. He gets irritated. It, it seems too easy. Go and wash seven times in the Jordan. Isn't the prophet going to do anything? Why wouldn't he uh, do some complicated ritual with Dancing and shouting and sacrifice and blood. Wouldn't the prophet send him on a great quest to prove his worth? Everything about this trip is a letdown. He's about to give up. 
Now, there's something about the way God works through grace that's almost offensive. See, God doesn't ask us to perform some great deed. He doesn't ask us to prove ourselves worthy of his mercy. All we do is trust in him. Now, we think there must be more to it. If something's for free, well, it can't be worth very much now, can it? Surely something worth having would be hard to get. Reconciliation with God through Jesus can't be free, can it? Wouldn't that be an insult to God? Surely he'd put up barriers and tests and gatekeepers to make sure that we don't take it for granted. Entry into God's kingdom and the gift of the Spirit and eternal life don't just go to anyone, do they? Wouldn't that be an insult to the more devoted among us? to the more spiritual among us. If any idiot can get it, if there's nothing special in me that can't attract the favour of God, it's almost as if God is saying he doesn't need us. He doesn't need our contribution. He's got this. And if we won't take that free gift, he'll just as easily give it to somebody else. Forgiveness Reconciliation with God, healing and wholeness by grace for free. Well, it looks condescending. It looks suspicious. It looks open to abuse. But ask yourself this. What is God after most of all? What's he looking for? Well, he's looking for humility. He's looking for creatures who know their creatures, who know they're their creation and not the creator. He's looking for people who know their place before him and know how much we need his help. That's the work he's done in us who come to him. That's the work he continues in all of us, even after years of traveling with him, to daily recognize that he is God and that we are not. Humility. This is the attitude that God's been fostering in Naaman ever since he started taking advice from a slave girl. God's going to teach him where he stands in relation to God because that's what he really needs after all. See, Naaman thinks his biggest need is a cure for leprosy. But God will give him much more than he set out for. God will give him a right understanding of his relationship to God. He'll give Naaman the humility to come empty-handed and receive mercy and wholeness from God. And again, it's a word from his servants that gets Naaman back on track. Verse 13, Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So Naaman relents and he does what Elisha told him to do. He goes to do this simple ritual, nothing complicated, just wash in the Jordan seven times. And as he travels there with his guards and servants and horses and chariots, perhaps the thought occurs to him. He's about to humble himself in this backwater river, in this backwater country. What if nothing happens? What if it was all a sham and he ends up looking foolish in front of his servants and his men? What if he winds up going home, tail between his legs, still leprous, still unchanged? Or maybe the God of Israel will work through this simple act of humility. So finally he gets to the Jordan, he goes down and washes and he comes out as good as new. His skin is restored. The leprosy is gone like he'd never even had it to begin with. And it's not just an outward transformation either. This cleansing has gone much deeper than that. Naaman returns to Elisha and he confesses in verse 15, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Please accept now a gift from your servant. Naaman is, is thankful, he's elated, 
He's giving recognition to Yahweh as the one who is sovereign over disease, the one who has control over the whole earth. An incredible breakthrough. And now we see how his conversion will work out practically in his life. Well, first of all, in generosity, he wants to show how much this means to him. He tries to offer the gifts he brought, the gold and silver and fine clothes. But Elisha refuses the gifts. And we'll, we'll return to that in a little bit. But the, the second way his conversion works out is Naaman's going to take his new faith with him back home. He asks Elisha in verse 17, Please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but the Lord. So we might ask, well, what's the dirt for? Well, in some symbolic way, he's going to use it as he offers sacrifices to Yahweh back home. And when he does, it will be apparent to everyone around him that he's not sacrificing to any Syrian god. No, this will be Naaman's public statement that he now identifies with and sacrifices only to the God of Israel. In verse 18, Naaman goes on, But may the Lord forgive your servant this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Rimon to bow down, and he's leaning on my arm, and I bow there also, when I bow down in the temple of Rimon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. So he's also taking his faith with him back into the workplace. Naaman won't separate his worship from his work. He's already thinking about the implications. What will it mean to serve the king of Aram as a worshipper of Yahweh? Well, he'll continue to carry out his duties as a faithful employee, but he won't be worshipping idols with the king. That's the difference. And Elijah consents. He says, go in peace. And we could just end the story there. A wonderful picture of free forgiveness. Naaman goes home changed, not just healed from his leprosy, but changed inside as well. And through no great work of his own, but through the great working of Yahweh, who chose to bless this foreigner in a time when his own people, the Israelites, we're going through a great time of apostasy and abandoning the faith of Yahweh to serve idols. But rather than affirm Israel in their unfaithfulness, God affirms a foreigner in his humility. Our Lord Jesus will later use Naaman as an example of the faith of an outsider, receiving healing at a time when God's people had largely turned away from him. <clears throat> this is from that famous sermon in the synagogue at Nazareth from Luke chapter 4. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath, in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. So in the time of Elijah and Elisha, God longs for his people to return to him and receive forgiveness and healing, but they continually and belligerently go after foreign gods. They look for satisfaction in places that will leave them unsatisfied, unfulfilled. They worship the created things rather than the creator. And in Jesus' day, the people of Nazareth want Jesus to prove himself, heal the sick, raise the dead. But Jesus knows their hearts. Their familiarity with him has made them hard to his teaching. And if foreigners and outsiders are more receptive to his message it's only because they've recognized Jesus' glory and the people from his hometown have not. They were expecting someone spectacular, not, not just a kid from down the road, 
It seems too cheap, too available, too easy. And they reject Jesus. Well, let's not make the same mistake. Let's not think that just because we've been given access to the throne of God, because we've drunk from the well of new life in the Spirit, because we have the seal of our promised inheritance in the kingdom of God, because it's all been given to us, and we reflect on how little we deserved it, that we conclude it must not be worth that much in the end. Don't make that mistake, but rather rejoice in the mercy of God that he's revealed himself to the weak, to the basic, to children, to outsiders, to us. Well, let me conclude with that awkward and surprising ending to the story where Elisha's servant Gehazi goes back after Naaman and he accepts a part of the gift that Elisha had rejected. What did Gehazi do wrong? Well, he accepted a payment for a gift. The thing that was supposed to be free and accessible and outrageously available in the end, it came at a cost because of Gehazi's greed. And Elisha calls him out. He condemns him and, and punishes him with Naaman's leprosy because no cost should ever be connected with repentance and salvation. No deed or work, great or small, should ever be attached to and conditional for a reconciliation with God. No great deed could ever accomplish all that. Well, no deed that is except one. There's one great deed that will be forever attached to our forgiveness. There's one great work that was the condition of our forgiveness and our acceptance, but it wasn't achieved by us. It was achieved in that great week that we've just celebrated when Jesus committed himself to the plan of God, when he walked the road to Jerusalem, he stood on trial, and he carried our sins to the cross, and he died there alone, condemned, cursed, abandoned. And he took the punishment that we deserved as he suffered and died in our place. And then rising to life in triumph over sin and death and all evil, he became the first of many who will one day rise to life. And because we stand in him, by faith, bringing nothing to the table but our failures, we will also be restored to wholeness. His great deed for all our misdeeds. His body broken, taken apart by professional killers, like a body racked with leprosy, falls apart. He was taken apart so that we could be made whole again cleansed, restored, renewed, inside and out. Let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you had mercy on Naaman and you used him as a powerful example of someone who came to receive your healing and wholeness apart from anything that he could contribute. Father, as we walk with you, may we be humble and always remember the great cost of our restoration, your mercy shown to us in Jesus' death and rising to life. We pray this in his precious name. Amen. We're we going to continue now in prayer for the world and for the church. Let's pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you have taught us to pray and to give thanks for all people. Receive our prayers for your world worldwide church, that it may know the power of your Spirit, and that all your children may agree in the truth of your Holy Word, 
and live in unity and godly love. We pray for our church here in Australia, our, our church community. We pray for Paul, our bishop, and Philip, our, our archbishop, and for all other ministers of your word and sacraments, that by their life and teaching, your glory may be revealed and all nations drawn to you. Guide and prosper, we pray, those who strive for the spread of your gospel and enlighten with your spirit all places of work, learning and healing. We think especially now of our major mission partners, Chris and Grace Adams in Timor-Leste, and we pray for them now in their time of need as, as floods uh, flow through Dili, we pray for those suffering from the flood. Please bring them help and aid and comfort. We pray for the leadership of the government, for various organisations and the church in response to this crisis. Please give them wisdom and the resources they need. And we pray for Chris, Chris and Grace as they sh seek to share Christ's love and hope with others during this time. We especially also think of them at, in this stage of the pandemic, as Timor Leste has seen uh, the numbers of infected rise. And we pray for a successful lockdown and uh, a bringing of healing to those who are ill. Father, we pray for those who have authority and responsibility among the nations, especially here in Australia, that ruling with wisdom and justice, they may promote peace and well-being in the world. To this congregation here at St. Luke's and to all your people in their different callings, give your heavenly grace that we may hear your holy word with reverent and obedient hearts and serve you truly all the days of our life. In your compassion, Father, comfort and heal those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, or sickness. We pray all these things in your holy name and in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Well, as we conclude our time together, it's just time for a couple of announcements. Uh, firstly, birthdays. It's Bobby Bigar's birthday this week, so a very happy birthday to you, Bobby. Uh, a couple of other announcements. It's uh, Hospitality Sunday at uh, Carilla Cafe next weekend, uh, of course, marking Anzac Day, and so that'll be from 11 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. Um, on, on the Sunday, and that's a, a $10 lunch um, for takeaway. And we've also got the Mother's Day Ladies High Tea coming up on the 1st of May. That's at 2.30 in the afternoon. So if you'd like to come and bring the ladies in, in your life, uh, that's $25 per person. Uh, and please make that booking with Marge Woods or call in the office. Well, thank you so much for being with us this morning and, and recalling God's mercy to his enemies as well as to his faithful people and the mighty power and sovereignty of God uh, across the world, and especially his sovereignty in bringing us salvation, apart from anything that we can contribute. Uh, let me leave you with a blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favour and bring you peace. Amen. God bless and keep safe.